Hello, I'm Tim, uh, but <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, let's talk about what you're going to get out of this presentation. Um, so we're going to be talking about a really flexible and powerful ELT. Uh, and yes, I mean ELT, not ETL. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, you're going to get an understanding of how this framework can be used for virtually any form of data source and data extraction task. And we're going to do it all through the lens of stock market data, which is about as far away from existing Cloud Query use cases as I could come up with and you know, a bit of a pet project of mine as well. Um, so as with any good FinTech project, um, oh, wrong slide, yeah. Uh, so as with any good FinTech project, uh, be it AI tracking a portfolio or you know, just analyzing the fall of a company from IPO to uh, delisting, uh, first thing that we need to do is uh, data collection, which is gonna be the primary focus of this talk. So by a show of hands, who here has heard of Cloud Query before? No one? Oh, one person, great. <laughs> and who here is just for stock market data or just because it's the open source track? <laughs> one more person, <laughs> wonderful. Well, then you two are in for a treat. Um, so yeah, uh, let's get back to this. So. Um, I, I said we'd get back to this, so uh, yeah, uh, I'm Tim. Um, so yeah, uh, who is this guy you've never heard of before and why should we care about what he has to say? Well, um, yeah, let's uh, hit that next slide and just <laughs> take a look. Uh, so I'm a senior developer, uh, well, senior developer advocate for Cloud Query and a software engineering consultant. Uh, before I made the switch to this, I was a lead engineer and I've got more than a decade and a half of software engineering experience. Uh, some people say I'm a little older than I look, but you know, maybe I just, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, generally I enjoy working on high performance and high throughput technology uh, in the net code and security spaces. So uh, yeah, this brings me to Cloud Query. Uh, so Cloud Query is a high performance uh, ELT framework. See, I told you we'd come back to this. Uh, it's extract, transform, and load is the normal pathway, right? Um, as you might know, that's what, um, the, sorry. Um, so yeah, extract, transform, load. A good example of this is Logstash. Uh, benefits being that it does inline, uh, inline transformations and kind of uh, allows you to keep the amount of data that you're storing limited, but that also means that you have limited throughput and the transformations are destructive. So yeah, uh, Logstash is really good at this, but um, because it extracts the data from the source, transforms it, and then loads it into a destination, it's kind of you know, uh, not necessarily ideal when data storage is actually the cheap part. So what is an ELT? Well, it kind of operates on a slightly different theorem, which you can summarize as store the data as close to the source format as possible. Uh, so generally speaking, it extracts the data from the source, loads the data into a database, and then by having logical table structures, enables it, uh, transformations to be done from that. So this means that even if uh, like the schema changes, you still have the raw data available, so you can always go back and uh, change uh, the, the kind of transformations if your source data no longer matches uh, what you're expecting in your transformations. So the other key benefit of this is the ability to extract truly massive amounts of data because you're not transforming things in real time. Uh, this kind of lowers the CPU re uh, requirements and allows you to actually uh, process far greater throughput. So. Let's take a look at the high-level architecture of Cloud Query. Um, so, where's the nearest one? There. Um, yeah, basically three main parts. There's the orchestrator that sits in the middle, and there's source plugins and destination plugins. So, source plugins, exactly what they sound like. They enable you to extract data from pretty much any API that you have, and transforms it into an Apache Arrow uh, columnar data format. Uh, which the orchestrator then uh, ships to the destination plugin in batches, which can then load it to pretty much any 
destination that you have. It could be Postgres, it could be Neo4j, you name it. So um, yeah, essentially Cloud Query uh, is based on gRPC. So a Cloud Query plugin is a gRPC service that collects data and provides it into an Apache Arrow-based tabular format. So yeah, uh, next slide. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, yeah, so generally speaking, we suggest that plugin developers use one of our SDKs as this abstracts away a lot of the complexity of building one of these, uh, one of these plugins. So uh, if we're looking at this one, um, you know, the architecture for the Python SDK, it's pretty simple. So first of all, the Python SDK uh, takes care of the gRPC connection uh, to the orchestrator. And when uh, the orchestrator calls the gRPC interface, uh, that goes ahead and uh, the scheduler will start spawning threads um, for each, uh, each of the table resolvers. Um, and the table resolvers will then iterate over the data from the API and generate table rows, yielding one dictionary object per row. Um, the resolvers then perform any validation that's needed on the row and ship the response back to the SDK. Uh, the SDK then handles conversion from uh, the native kind of dictionary object into the, uh, the actual um, Apache Arrow uh, structure defined in the table class, which it then streams to the orchestrator for you as pretty much as quickly as it's available because the orchestrator handles shipping it to the, uh, uh, to the output, uh, the destination plugin. So um, yeah, this architecture kind of enables plugins to uh, process immense data sets with ease. Um, so now that we have kind of a high level understanding of how the plugins work, Let's take a look at the data that we're going to look at. Uh, the QR code, by the way, has links to the repo, the data, and um, the, a, a bunch of other stuff that might be helpful. Um, so yeah, to keep this task on time, um, we're actually, well, keep this talk on time, rather. We're only gonna look at one of the endpoints that are available from, uh, in this case, the London Stock Exchange um, delayed market data. So this is the data that they're legally, provide, uh, legally required to provide. Uh, at a 15 minute delay. Um, but you know you can implement the others. Uh, later on, I'll be adding the others to the project repo so you can take a look at those as well. Um, but yeah, so the first thing we want to do is download the CSV file for the Exxon post sale data, which as I said, is delayed by 15 minutes. Uh, so this gives us an idea of the specific formatting that we're going to see um, and the suitable data types that we might want to uh, load up. So if I just tab into the correct place. Want this one. Okay, so we'll drag that over here. And now I just need to go and download. Oops. What's that? going to be over here. Uh, and we want to go to here. So, um, what's that say? I can't see. Ah, go away. All right. Here we go. So, um, you can get the thing from the QR code, uh, the link if you want it later. Um, but yeah, let's go and just pull the very latest minute of data. And that's all we need from there. That one. Is that the... That's... That's for later. We don't need that yet. Um, <laughs> let me just grab this back over here. Sorry. Uh, right. So now we have our delayed market data. I'm just going to drag this CSV file into here. Okay. So 
here's what our CSV file looks like. Um, that's not terribly readable, so uh, yeah, we'll just um, switch back to here for now. Um, yeah, so uh, essentially, what we have is semicolon separated data. Uh, actually, I think I can probably zoom in on that for you. So, no, okay. It doesn't want me to zoom in. Anyway, it's uh, semicolon separated data. Uh, we've got multiple columns here. And yeah, in the slide, I've just uh, transposed it um, so that we can see it more easily. Um, so yeah, here. We have uh, a whole bunch of different data types. Um, ideally, we'd be able to kind of like work out what this looks like from a standard or an API spec, but uh, London Stock Exchange doesn't seem to want to provide one for the uh, free data. So here we are, looking at data. Um, yeah, anyway, as we can see, it's semicolon uh, separated, and we see a bunch of different columns, and yeah. Uh, at the very bottom, we've got a column called MIFID flags that is also comma separated. We could pro uh, pass that, but it's not that interesting. So looking at the columns that are empty, those are probably deprecated, but uh, they might just be redacted because we're looking at the free data rather than um, you know, the actual live interesting data that they want us to pay for. Um, so for this, we're just going to pretend that they don't exist. Um, you can choose how to handle it how you want, but I think just ignoring them is probably fine. Uh, we have all the interesting data that we want. So yeah, uh, we have a distribution time, uh, we have an instrument ID, we have the transaction identification code, which is, um, yeah, uh, what, what's that? It's, I forget what formats it's in, um, but yeah, it's a fairly standard stock market format. Uh, then we have the MIFID price, which should be a fixed point float, but they provided it as an actual just regular float here. Uh, then we have the quantity. Uh, then we have the date and time that the trade was uh, requested. Then we have uh, just a ID code that is internal to, oh, sorry, no, that's the standard ID code. The other one, the numeric one was the internal one from London Stock Exchange, sorry. Uh, then we have the price, and uh, venue of execution is just which one of the London Stock Exchange interfaces was used. Uh, we have some uh, the publication time. Uh, that's kind of when it was told, well, when everyone else found out that this had happened. Um, transaction cleared, well, that just is kind of irrelevant for this table. Um, and as I said before, the MIFID flags. So, um, yeah. How does this translate into a table class? Um, where is my thing gone? Uh, this one. There we go. So um, how does that translate into a kind of Cloud Query table class? Uh, well, first of all, we want to uh, reorder these slides. I don't know. Um, yeah. So first thing that you might want to do uh, is go ahead and pick up the template. Um, so the template is available here. Um, but as I said, uh, just scan the QR code and you can grab it from there. It's a bit easier to find. Um, so yeah, uh, the template. Basically, even though the SDK is already quite easy to use, uh, we've actually gone ahead and made a template uh, to make it even easier. So you can just go and uh, kind of fork this template, and uh, then you're pretty much good to go. So the template looks like this when you actually load it up. Um, but we'll come back to that in a moment. So um, yeah, so how do we go about building this plugin? Well. As I said earlier, we want to take a look at how that uh, data that we looked at translates into an actual table class first. So the table class is uh, the thing that actually defines what the table row looks like over in the uh, thread section at the top right there. So um, pulling up that 
uh, data that we've got. We've got the distribution time. That was interesting. So we're going to copy that in. And uh, yeah, we just kind of define columns like this. So we have um, essentially we say what the table name is. Uh, we give it a human readable title so that if people want to look this up later, then they can do. Uh, we have uh, column definitions. Uh, which here we've got uh, the distribution timestamp, got the trading timestamp, transaction ID, instrument ID, uh, ISIN instrument code, that's what I was looking for earlier, um, the currency, price, and quantity. So instrument ID there being the London Stock Exchange one, the ISIN one being the kind of international standard for these things. So yeah, um, where do we define that? Inside our... Um, Inside our template here, we have a, oh, oh, man, I really should have zoomed this in before. Uh, there should be a presentation mode here somewhere. Well, uh, ooh, this is harder to do than I was expecting. Um, anyway, uh, there's a file over here that's um, in the tables directory of the template. Um, and then, yeah, inside there, there's one called items. And so what we want to do is we want to just go and uh, kind of rename that. And you know, I just renamed that in the presentation to Exxon post delayed uh, and yeah, filled in the, the data. You can find more about this and you can also find a much more rehearsed tutorial uh, for actually building Cloud Query plugins using this framework online. Uh, I actually have a YouTube video that you'll find in the readme of this template, um, just because I get a bit nervous on stage. So yeah, uh, that's fun. Um, anyways, uh, let's go back to the slides. Um, so yeah, uh, you'll find the file called items.py, and um, in there you'll find an example of the child table class. And yeah, we just want to kind of change the names into something that's human readable. And instead of having uh, camel case, uh, sorry, instead of having, uh, yeah, no, camel case, uh, we want to use snake case, um, just because it's just how cloud query tables generally are named and the uh, columns are named. So yeah. Um, Skip ahead of it because I'm running a bit behind schedule. Um, yeah, so uh, what we've done is um, we've got the timestamp format, which uh, basically takes in the, uh, well, pretty much any date time format that you provide it. Um, then we have a uint64 for the transaction ID, a uint64 for the instrument ID a string for the ISIN version of the instrument code, uh, then a string for the currency, float64 for the price, and a UN64 for the quantity, because that always has to be positive. So now we've got our table defined. Um, we actually need to implement the API client. Um, since the London Stock Exchange has decided to make it quite unreasonably difficult for us to do this, um, yeah. We have to go ahead and, well, in order to get a copy of the free data anyway, um, they've, made it, they've made it interesting. Uh, so as with much of the free data in the world, we're going to kind of have to resort to a little web scraping. So essentially, we need to go and scrape the login form for the CR, uh, CSRF token, um, which you'll find there. Um, and then we use that to get a login. Um, and a session cookie, and then we start pulling data. So yeah, there's a, a bit of a, a login function there that handles that. Um, so this is using uh, requests as the actual kind of HTTP framework and beautiful soup to pull the, uh, the kind of actual hidden value. Um, in an ideal world, they'd obviously implement an API, uh, but as is the case with a lot of the free data. Um, yeah, we kind of have to resort to web scraping. So yeah, um, sorry about this. Um, yeah, so essentially uh, we create our own form using the, the session 
and uh, provide our username and password and the CSRF token, and then if there's an error, we're just gonna raise for the status. Um, so like if it's basically a non, uh, well, anything above a 400 um, just goes and raises a, an error state. So yeah, um, now that we've got our logged in session, what about the file names? Because um, obviously we don't want to be scraping the, the actual website to find the list of file names, that would be silly. Um, so since we've got our logged in session, um, looking at the kind of path for these files, it's, it's fairly simple and straightforward. So yeah, all I did was uh, take that and go, you know, okay, well, DMD, download, post trade, sure, LSE, FCA, that's fairly straightforward. And then the actual venue, so xlon dash post, and then there's a date stamp. Um, so looking at the date stamps, uh, they're minute separated, and uh, it's fairly straightforward. So it's just you know hour, hour, minute, minute, and then everything from 8 a.m. through to uh, the end of day. So in order to kind of build an iterator for this, uh, we can kind of go a pretty simple way here. Uh, we build our, our kind of directory path, because that's standard. Uh, we set the end date time. Uh, we set up a cursor that's at the start date time of 8 a.m. And then we just check that the, the cursor's not actually on a, week, uh, a weekend, so the weekday has to be less than five. Um, and then we just literally go through and pull every single one of those with a while loop. Uh, obviously raising for a status if there's a problem, because that might mean that we've been logged out or that we've been blocked. Um, and then, yeah, uh, we decode the CSV file, uh, load it into the dict reader, and uh, yield that out to uh, our, uh, to, to the resolver. So, um, yeah, what's next? Well, we need to build a resolver. So yeah, that's the, the bottom left cube there of the, the top thread section. Um, and again, it's pretty straightforward. So at this point, we just haven't reconciled the difference between the table name and the column names uh, from the CSV files. So if we didn't do that, it would obviously lead to some problems. Um, so this is where the resolver comes in. Uh, here, I'm just cleaning the dictionary and renaming the ones from the CSV file to the actual um, kind of table response. Uh, you could theoretically, if you kept exactly the same names, get away with it because there is an automatic converter there. But generally speaking, it's, it's best to actually do the conversion yourself because it makes you question whether or not you've actually had exactly the same names. Um, so yeah, the next thing for the resolver, um, Obviously, we want to kind of check that we've got sane values before we store them, because um, you know if they're not sane, then why are we storing that data at all? And yeah, there's kind of one way to handle that, which is just well, I mean, there's two ways. You could build a, a pedantic model and and run it through that as well, but uh, the easiest way is just to do a, a list of if statements. And then the last thing that we need to do for actually building a Cloud Query plugin is the config spec. So the config spec is like how you tell the plugin what it actually needs. Uh, well, it's, it's how the plugin tells Cloud Query's um, actual orchestrator what it needs. So like, does it need usernames, passwords, API, spec, uh, API keys, et cetera? Um, and then it kind of loads that out and yeah, uh, it gives you like a config file that you can work with as well. So yeah, um, just need to kind of, thanks. Um, yeah, so at this stage, we wanna go through and just tell it, okay, well, we're gonna need a username. Uh, it's just standard Python data class. So we say, okay, well, we need a username, we need a password. We might want to be able to edit the base URL at some point, but otherwise not. And we just want to validate that that's correct and that we have uh, usernames and passwords there. So yeah, um, at that point, you can go and kind of analyze the data. Uh, I'm apparently out of time, so we're just skipping to this slide. Uh, but yeah, 
from that point on, you kind of you have the data in the database. Uh, so if I show that quickly, I'm just going to need to pull this over to the other screen so I can see what I'm doing. Yeah, so here's the output data. Um, I'd show the, uh, I, I would show the dashboard that I made earlier, but um, I've, I've run out of time for those slides. So yeah, uh, here we've got the raw data all pulled in. Um, this is uh, a full 24 hours worth of data and uh, mostly because of the delays from the London Stock Exchange, it takes about 30 minutes to pull the data. Um, but yeah, that's every single transaction. So it's not quite the same as ticker data, so you kind of need to work out what the prices are. Sometimes things aren't traded on a particular day, uh, so you need to kind of go from there. But yeah, it's, it's all there. And um, yeah, uh, Grafana is a great tool for building the dashboards from there. Um, yeah, thanks. Any questions, I guess? I know I've kind of flown through things and yeah, been a bit uh, rushed. Uh, we've got a question at the back there. Oh, yeah, sure. There you go. So yeah, in there uh, you'll find um, uh, a bunch of stuff, but the main one, if you want to take a look through the code for the project, um, you'll find a branch that's called one table. That's the branch that contains all of the information from uh, like this actual slideshow. And yeah, if you uh, kind of go ahead with that one, then um, in a, a short while, maybe a, a day or two, we'll have the uh, multi-table example as well that shows all of the different tables that you can get from there uh, being pulled. And yeah, uh, if you want a bit more of a coherent version of this talk, uh, there is a YouTube video in the, in the readme file. Um, so <laughs> yeah, thanks for, thanks for listening in, yeah. Good stuff, thanks Tim, round of applause. <laughs>